The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world. In America, the rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Hi, I'm Jason Stein, host of Cars and Culture. Before we get to this week's interview, I want to say that this episode is brought to you by Connected by Reynolds & Reynolds. I love the conversations I get to have on this show because they're exactly that. They're conversations. Another podcast I found worth checking out for conversations is Connected by Reynolds & Reynolds. Greg Eulen goes deep with guests on everything from used car acquisitions to finding your niche and selling to it. I definitely recommend adding Connected to your rotation. Welcome to Cars and Culture on Sirius XM and episode 124. I'm your host, Jason Stein. The kid knew he was going to be good, that he was driven, and that he could achieve the impossible. And if so, why not proclaim it to the world? Why not declare your intentions and then just go out and do it? And that's exactly what Ezra Frick did at age nine when he took to the national airwaves to tell his story. That day on the Ellen DeGeneres show, Ezra shared his goals and even told the host that he would make the 2020 Paralympics. And the same kid came back seven years later to share the fact that he did, in fact, make the games. What a dream, what a journey, and what a drive out of a kid who has known nothing but drive since he knew that he had to work harder than anyone else to achieve what he wanted to do. And he's done everything he ever wanted, including overcoming a lot. He was born without most of his left leg and missing fingers on his left hand. When he was two years old, Ezra had surgery to remove his lower left leg and transplanted a toe from his amputated foot onto his left hand at Boston's Children's Hospital. He received a prosthetic leg when he was 11 months old. But that's only part of the story. Ezra is a phenom, but not just for the athletic achievements, but for the person whom he is. At 18, he's already a motivational speaker, as well as one of the great hopes in the Paris 2024 Summer Games for Team Toyota and Team USA. He's his own cultural phenom. He's positive, inspirational, motivational, and driven. In 2006, he and his family founded Team Ezra to provide financial resources to organizations that serve people and physical disabilities. And in 2013, he and his father founded Angel City Sports, to provide free year-round access to sports training, equipment, and competitive opportunities for kids and adults with physical disabilities. He's like very few guests we've had on this program. Today, a story that is as remarkable as it is inspiring. Hey everybody, it's Ezra Freck here, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. What a pleasure to have our second Olympian on the program. And his is an inspirational story. We're gonna get into that. We're also gonna get into the fact that he not only has that story, but he's an inspirational guy in in a lot of ways. And I'm very happy to meet you. I know a lot about you. I've learned a lot about you. Ezra, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited uh, to be here and, and speak with you today. You have an infectious personality, and I know our listeners are going to pick up on that probably in the first couple of uh, minutes here. But let's start off with uh, what you're doing right now. Uh, how's your training going? Let's reset a little bit for 2023 before we even consider what Paris looks like in 2024. What is it? What's on the daily routine for you, Ezra? Yeah, good question. Right now, we're in uh, in the off season, so everything is not very intense, not super strenuous. We went for quite some time, almost two and a half years straight without a break from the track. And so taking some time away from the track, still staying in good shape, weightlifting, working out, pool workouts, yoga, giving the body time to really recover so that very shortly we will pick it up again and run through Paris, which is which is obviously the, the main goal. So we asked Gabby Thomas this. Mm. We said, what do you do during the off season? And she says, a whole lot of nothing. So mm. what do you, is your, do you try to spend enough time on a whole lot of nothing as well? You know, everyone, everyone approaches the off season slightly differently. I know for myself, I get really restless when I'm not doing a lot. And so I have to be moving. I have to be doing things. So I probably do more than the average track athlete during the off season, just because mentally I feel like I have to. Um, but that includes a lot of time where I am relaxing as well, where I'm spending time with the family, spending time with my friends, my girlfriend, the people in my life I love, and letting me sort of re 
to regroup, get that energy back to then hit it next year. Cause, cause really it can be tiring to go year round, year round, year round. That's how people burn out. You have to give yourself time mentally to prepare for what's next. Almost this sort of recuperation period. And mine consists consists of maybe more physical activity than some other people's, but it still is substantially less than what I would be doing in season. So what does that mean? You only spend eight hours in the gym instead of 12? Yeah, yeah eight hours instead of 12. <laughs> <laughs> and mentally, I, I mean, the mental part of of what you do is such a critical part of it, isn't it? That That is so underestimated. How do you really make sure that as, as you gear up to next summer, that you're sharpening your mind as much as possible? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think the mental part is equally as important, if not more important than the physical part. Oftentimes at this elite level, people train very similarly, right? They're in similar shape. They're athletically very gifted. It's the mental that separates a lot of it. And so for me, at least, what I do once I begin track season is we take the mental aspect very seriously. I meditate every single day. I'll meditate every single day, probably starting in a month or so, all the way through Paris. Every single day I meditate, I visualize, I have an exact picture of what I want to accomplish, how I'm going to accomplish it, and what I'm going to feel when I accomplish it. And I do that every single day to make sure that mentally I'm focused on the right things. I'm not letting anything external distract me from getting closer to my goals. And I'm staying in line with that consistent meditation. And then, of course, all throughout the day, I'm visualizing. All throughout the day, I'm thinking about this. This is what goes through my head 24-7. It's what I think about obsessively. And so I'm, my my head is always on straight and I'm always targeted. I'm always aimed at at the goal. And that's the way my life is is always been structured. How long have you been meditating like that? I've been meditating for quite some time. Um, leading up to Tokyo was the first time I did that consistent of a meditation regimen leading into a competition. And then for world championships this year, I did the exact same thing. And honestly, it's been remarkable for me to have something so consistently that allows me to really hone in, focus, practice that mental focus as well. Oftentimes in this day and age, there's a million things happening, a million ways to get easy access to entertainment and dopamine hits and all stuff like that. But with meditation, you're really focusing the mind, concentrating and and practicing what you're going to feel when you're in competition. How long are those meditation sessions? They range. They range. Sometimes it'll be five to 10 minutes if I'm in a rush. Other times it can be 20, 30 minutes if I'm going over something over and over and over again. Uh, I, I like to leave it quite flexible in case my schedule has some constraints for whatever reason. And did you, in learning to do that, was there someone or something that led you to that pathway? I mean, you yeah, don't my, wake up one day and start meditating. meditating. Yeah, exactly. My mom, my mom was the main reason I started meditating. Okay. Um, she's, she's taught meditation at my brother's schools for, you know, a couple of years and been really head over heels into the whole mental side of things. And so I have a sports psychologist, um, but my mom is probably my other sports psychologist as well in the way that she helps me prepare mentally and it really got me into meditation. And we should say, for those who may not know, your mom might've helped you do that, but she's also made her own impact in the world as well. I mean, yeah. she, she yeah. is she's a Hollywood actress who has appeared in movies such as Crash uh, about 20 years ago and uh, Saw, mainly Saw 3 back in mm-hmm. 2006. So she comes from her own level of um, intensity and uh, oh, yeah. mental uh, stamina. What else has your mom brought to your own athletic endeavors? Yeah, I think I think my mom, well of course, I will say that learning to deal with high intensity, high pressure situations stems from what my parents have instilled in me when I was very young. I mean, my mom was an actress always in situations like that. So learning to handle the pressure, handle the moment, appreciate the moment, not crumble when the lights turn on is something that I've definitely learned from her, which has obviously applied very well to to competing on the international stage and being in the limelight. But I would say the main thing that my mother instilled in me was from a very young age, she knew that, of course, a lot of people with physical disabilities oftentimes are very insecure. They walk around in public, people stare at them all the time, point fingers, whisper. They, they, they're seen as outsiders in a sense. They feel like outsiders because they're excluded everywhere they go. 
And for her, she wanted to make sure that I would never retreat to that insecurity about my disability, but rather be proud of who I am, confident in myself. And so since a very young age, she always told me, you walk into any room, put your chin up, chest out, walk in like you own the place. And instilling that in me at a very young age over time helped me develop the confidence to own who I am, regardless of disability or not. And then in turn, I've been able to apply that same confidence, that same force of enthusiasm and acceptance in myself to the track. And then I attack everything the same way because of that confidence that she ingrained in me throughout the, my early childhood. Amazing. And you know, you grew up playing soccer and basketball, flag yeah. football, and then track and field. And you said once that, you know, going to the high school track meet, most didn't expect that the one-legged kid would go out and win the competition. And when, it, when you were younger, it got to you and it really provided a motivator and it was exciting to prove people wrong, really to shock them. Right, Ezra? Yeah, that's, that's a main motivator for me is proving people wrong. And that's because growing up everywhere I went, I was underestimated everywhere I went. No one would expect a kid with one leg to win the high jump competition or play club basketball or be active enough to keep up with his able-bodied friends. And so that was a main driving force for me to prove people wrong, show people what's possible as an amputee. And that's still the case to this day. I set really ambitious, really audacious, unrealistic goals. I want to one day go down as one of the greatest Paralympians of all time and win golds across the board and do things that most Paralympians couldn't, you know, would never fathom as something that they would actually go after. But it's the same sense of trying to prove people wrong, trying to prove people, whether it's kids at my high school who didn't think that the one leg kid could beat them in a high jump competition, or if it's people all around the world that don't expect the kid from Cali with some shaggy hair to go out and win gold at the Paralympics. It's that same sense of proving people wrong, proving myself right, and proving the people that believe in me right. I love it. And in fact, you, you put the world on notice. Anyway, when you were 11 years Thank old, you. you told everyone who would listen that you were going to compete in the Paralympic Games in Tokyo in 2020. And sure enough, you did. Yeah, that's, listen, I think that's the way it has to be. You have to structure your goals like that. That's the way I've always been. As I set that unrealistic, impossible goal, and then I go after it with everything I have. You know, uh, there's a quote that I really love that says, most people fail not because they set goals that are too high and then don't accomplish it, but rather because they set goals that are too low and then they accomplish those. So mm -hmm. in turn, they are leaving potential on the table and failing because they're not setting goals that are pushing them enough. They're not setting goals that are high enough. And so I've always been one to set really high goals and then go after it with everything I have and speak about it as if I'm going to do it 100%. And then sure enough, that law of attraction, that manifestation, the power of the universe, when you put things out there like that, when you can see it here and you can speak it here, it comes to you. It's the book, The Secret, isn't it, that everybody mm -hmm. talks about? Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've read. And the chances of you, in fact, getting to Tokyo in 2020, you've said were unbelievably low. Um, but you put it out there. You worked and sacrificed. You put all of your resources in place to make it happen. And it occurred because... You started on your own impossible. I loved reading that. You started on your own impossible and made it possible. It's uh, that, that kind of thinking um, obviously becomes infectious when you've had the kind of success that you've had. You're inspiring others. You know that, right? I appreciate it. I, that's the goal all along, right? That's the goal of a lot of medals and world records and world championship titles. That's all great. And that's, a part of what I hope my, to be my bigger purpose, but to use those things and use that to hopefully inspire the next generation, inspire the next kid to start his impossible, the next kid to look up at me and set that daunting goal, that scary goal, but then go after it the same way because I was once in his or her position. You're such a very determined young man. Where does that drive come from? Honestly, I believe we're all here for a purpose. And I carry the weight of a very, a very large and what I believe can be impactful purpose of changing the way our country and changing the way the world views disability. My larger goals are 
to normalize disability on a global scale and be a source of inspiration as showing the world what a kid with one leg can do. And so I carry a very heavy burden of what I want to, what change I want to enact in the world. And then in turn, I must attack that with everything I have because I know how impactful I hope to, the impact I hope to have. I feel that there is a lot of systemic change that needs to be made regarding disability. I believe that people with disability, it's disability is almost seen as taboo. People are afraid to talk about it because there hasn't been someone with the physical disability that's been able to represent the community on a global stage internationally and break into that mainstream media. When we talk about representation, we talk about the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion movement, but disability is that minority group that always tends to lag behind. And I want to drive that movement forward. And so knowing the burden of what I hope and aim to accomplish as far as moving the disability movement forward, it can do nothing but serve to fuel that fire in me to attack it with everything I have, because I, I know the lives that, that could be changed. And it's also education too, isn't it? And mm. and maybe a lack of education, a lack of understanding on the part lack. of those who don't who aren't in the same situation. Exactly. Exactly. You've made it your purpose. You have a foundation to help athletes with disabilities. How did that come about? And why do you feel it's important to reach out to this group? Yeah, I think well, the the reason we originally started our nonprofit, Angel City Sports, my family and friends and I, was because we were traveling all over the country for these track meets, these, adapt these adaptive sports track meets. And it was at these events where we were realizing, why are we going all the way across the country for adaptive and Paralympic sport? Why are there no opportunities for people with physical disabilities to participate in sports in Southern California? And so once we realized that and we understood the landscape and how little opportunities were out there, if you had a physical disability, we said, this is something the community needs because we know the power of sport. We know what it does for you physically, psychologically, what it does for your soul, how it builds confidence, builds connections between people. Why is there a group, a community that now does not have access to this? Because let's be real, people with disabilities are almost told by society that sports is not for them. Mm -hmm. Many people don't even know that the Paralympics exist. They get injured, they get an accident, whatever it might be, and they think their life is over. They think they'll never be active again. And that's so not true. There is a beautiful world of adaptive sports that is waiting for anyone with a physical disability. And so we now are really passionate about bringing that, bringing that op the opportunity of sport to a community that oftentimes didn't know it existed otherwise. And, uh, and listen, sports is powerful for anyone, but for people who thought that they would never play sports again and never be active again, it is truly transformational. And in fact, if we take, if we go back to the inception of Angel City Sports formed in 2013, along with your dad, uh, Clayton, uh, you went to the Endeavor Games, right? Yes. You were eight years old. And it was out on the track at the Endeavor Games on a Sunday afternoon when you asked a question, which was? We said, why are we going to Tornado Alley in tornado season to <laughs> run, jump, and throw stuff? Oklahoma. <laughs> Oklahoma. Good old Oklahoma. And you were on a mission to to really chase down officials and 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 have them do things at a, at a local level in, in L.A., and now when we look at it, an annual multi-sport competition, you have more than 11 adaptive sports, right? This is all free, correct, yeah. Ezra? Correct, right. correct. A lot, of, a lot of the disabled community is in disenfranchised communities, and obviously financial struggles are a big difficulty. Particularly, we have lots of expensive equipment. My running blade is really expensive. Wheelchair basketball chairs, wheelchair tennis chairs, throwing chairs, really expensive. And so making this free for the community because we know how hard it can be is very crucial. Yeah. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Thank so you. Your positivity, your positivity and purpose are very inspirational to many. But one reason why you're a motivational speaker and have been for some time is because of that. How has your message changed or has it over the years? Oh, that's a good question. 
I think when I was younger, my message was obviously the message of a, you know, an eight, nine, 10 year old boy still figuring out his disability still with not too many experiences in around the world. Um, but luckily enough, because of track and field, I've been able to travel the world. I've been able to have experiences that that have shaped the way I view disability, shaped the way I view goal setting, shaped the way I view society. And so I've been very lucky to have these experiences during high school in years where obviously not a lot of kids get to travel the world and compete on the international stage and have conversations like this. And so my message has changed just because I've changed as a person and because my philosophies on goal setting, my philosophies on disability and the way we should look at disability have changed. Um, but at the core, I'm still that same kid who's aiming to show people that being different is okay. Right. right. We're, we, we will love each other no matter what. We're all different, whether we look different, whether we, whether we think different or act different, we all have our own differences and challenges. And, uh, the main goal is just continue to normalize disability. Just the way it's normalized through the, the speaking has obviously evolved as I've, I've gotten older. Did the number of people listening to you change after Tokyo? Yeah, I mean, the the if you Bigger go by, by social media metrics, probably the number of people listening or following definitely <laughs> definitely changed and hopefully will we'll continue to change. And listen, there's a lot of people in the entertainment industry, in the sports world, they want to be famous just to be famous. They want the clicks, they want the views, they want that lifestyle, they want the attention. I don't want to be famous just to be famous. Every single person that, that follows me, every single person that consumes whatever content I'm putting out, disability is slightly more normalized in their eyes. And they're slightly more understanding and aware of disability and of the Paralympics. And so I'm trying to be intentional with everything and making sure that this is not for the wrong reasons. Everything I want to do is so that I can be that person for the next generation. Because let's be real, when I was growing up, I didn't have someone in the mainstream media with a physical disability whom I could look to and say, oh, I want to do something like that. So I want to be that person for the next generation. Yeah. I, there, there's a, a quote that that I read that you said, you said, what's the point of sulking in sadness and feeling sorry for myself? I can't change the situation. My leg isn't growing back, so I might as well make the most of my life. That kind of encapsulates all of it, doesn't it? Exactly. And that was and, something I actually I had to realize when I was younger because although now I have a very positive outlook and I've been able to have these amazing experiences, it was not easy. And there is no shortcutting the difficulty of living with a disability. It was hard. And it took me a while to come to that realization where I was thinking, I was born this way. I literally cannot change right. my situation. So feeling sorry for myself, feeling bad does nothing. I might as well accept it, make the most out of my life. And of course, my parents and family were instrumental to guiding me to that point. What's it like to be a Toyota sponsored athlete? To have Toyota behind you. It's, it's a dream come true for me to have Toyota behind me. Back when I was 11 years old, making these goals of going to the Paralympics, I had a vision board and being a part of Team Toyota was on that vision board. No kidding. And when I was a young kid, as I was aspiring to make the games, just being a part of Team Toyota was on that vision board as well as winning a world title and breaking a world record. It was up there with those larger goals that I was setting for myself. And so to see this all come to fruition in the way I envisioned as uh, 11, 12, 13 year old boy is very special. And I'm super grateful to be aligned with a company that believes in the power of the Paralympics the same way I do. That's yeah. really what it is. It's yeah. hard to find uh, partners that you are so aligned with. And Toyota is that, I mean, what they, what they've done for the Paralympic movement, unprecedented, unparalleled. And I'm grateful to be, be backed by a company that sees my vision in the same light and is doing everything in their power to help help us really change the world. And we've had many people from Toyota on this program, but I get the sense that Toyota embraces that the fact that mobility should be available to all people, regardless of age, location, and abilities. And in fact, they've been exactly. very they've been very uh, forward with that. And um, a Super Bowl commercial from last year, actually, which I'm uh, which I know you saw. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's what it's all about. I mean, that's what I'm about. That's literally in my DNA mobility for all. We started this nonprofit to allow people with physical disabilities 
to be mobile, be active. This is literally what my family and I stand for. And so to be partnered with a company that has those same values is super special. And interestingly enough, a couple of years ago, I developed an extremely strong passion for teaching above the knee amputees to run for the very first time. It can be very difficult to run as an above the knee amputee because the leg kicks out and you have to trust it. And it's very hard to learn from say an able-bodied person to teach you to run for the very first time, especially after an accident. And so I developed a real passion teaching these amputees to run for the first time, which once again, directly aligned with that idea of mobility for all and, and allowing these people to feel the freedom of mobility. You're not old enough to be teaching people to do things, are you? <laughs> <laughs> maybe just maybe just, maybe, maybe just running, maybe just maybe just track stuff, uh, world stuff, and politics and all that stuff. <laughs> I'll stick to the learning, right? I'll st- history, math, English. I'll stick to the learning, but track stuff, maybe I can uh, lend out a few pointers. Have you had a chance to speak with Toyota engineers about specific needs or wants from physically challenged customers? Yeah, I mean, I've 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 seen lots of athletes uh, and lots of people with physical disabilities and the accommodations that Toyota has obviously put in place. I luckily, um, you know, not not luckily per se, but rather I've growing up, I was sort of able to infiltrate into the mainstream, and so I don't have too many uh, accessibility needs as far as the adaptations for the car goes. Um, but I know how uh, accepting they have been in the past, so. Yeah, if they were uh, to consult you extensively on those issues, if you were asked, I'm guessing you would take up the charge. I don't even yeah. have, don't even need to think about that. Most yeah. definitely. Most definitely. Before we get back to this interview, I want to say that this episode is brought to you by Connected by Reynolds & Reynolds. If you want to hear great conversations and Greg Eulen going deep with guests on everything from used car acquisitions to finding your niche and selling to it, I recommend adding Connected to your podcast rotation. Now let's get back to my interview. What's the one thing an automaker or maybe any and all car makers can do to make mobility better for people with disabilities? I think it's to have the conversations and be in touch with the community the way Toyota has. Oftentimes people hear disability and it's taboo and they don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't Mm -hmm. want to say something that might offend someone. And then in turn, we don't have conversations like this. We don't have car companies like Toyota who have done such an amazing job of leaning into the community. And so when you avoid these conversations, then we're not moving the needle forward. We're not moving the inclusive movement forward and we're not providing proper accessibility for our community, which is obviously the physically disabled community. So my advice would be lean in, have those conversations with good intentions, try, step into the unknown and accept that, you know, having conversations that with good intentions is much better than being scared, taboo, and then not having any conversations at all. And then we're not moving the needle forward. Team Toyota in general, what have you learned from your teammates, those who you've gotten a chance to meet now over the course of the time that you've been on the team? I'm, I must say, I am so grateful to be a part of a team with such amazing people. You, Every single person on Team Toyota, down to earth, kind, warm, welcoming, motivated, purpose-driven, literally the most, some of the most amazing people I've ever met in the sports world. And what it does for me is provides me with that extra fire, that extra motivation, because I know that I'm surrounded and I've got the backs and they have my backs of an amazing team of individuals, like-minded people striving to hopefully accomplish something great, but then in turn with a real sense of purpose behind everything they do. And uh, I've become great friends with lots of people on the team. We've made amazing connections. I'm training probably with a couple of them. They're probably going to come out to the Angel City Games. We'll always be supporting one another. I've literally been adopted into this beautiful little family, which is the Team Toyota family. And uh, it's unbelievably special to be surrounded by such amazing people who have in turn pushed me, supported me, and helped me become a better version of myself. Yeah, that's wonderful. As you think about your pathway to next summer, what what excites you the most about Paris 2024? I was quite devastated in Tokyo. I walked off the track in fifth place. I was yeah. about an inch away from the bronze medal. 
Hmm. And it was a really difficult pill for me to swallow. It was really difficult to process. I was really devastated. I look forward to getting my revenge. I look forward to going out there in Paris and doing what I knew I should have done in Tokyo. I'm now in a much better position. I've worked unbelievably hard. I'm prepared to continue to sacrifice everything, give 110% over this next 11 months leading up to the games in Paris. And I've got a lot of people behind me. I've got an amazing team. I've got amazing sponsors like Toyota, a family that is literally pushing me to be better. And I look forward to making them all proud and doing what I've always said I was going to do, doing what I've always envisioned I was going to do, which is win that Paralympic gold for the first time and do it in front of the beautiful city of Paris with people in the stands. Yeah, that's so (laughs) excited for. I literally lay in bed at night and I sit there all day thinking about what Paris is going to be like and manifesting that into a reality. So you ever been to Paris? Been to Paris a couple of times, actually. I was uh, for you. I was there in February, uh, and then I was just there a couple months ago for World Championships. We actually had our World Championships in Paris a year, a year about away, a year away from the Paralympics. Yeah, it'll be it'll be quite a scene for sure. I, I Are you going to be there? Are you going to be there? I'll be there holding your bag, whatever whatever you need. You you got to come. You got to come. You got to come <laughs> watch. That'd be so fun. <laughs> I would love to. Um, inches away. From a bronze, I want to go back to what you just said, Ezra. I mean, this is an incredible moment, right? Because you think about the, that razor thin difference between third or fifth. Yeah. You also said that you're better now. What did you have to do? What do you have to do to cover those inches to get yeah. to the podium? Yeah. It's listen. It's a tough game, high jump. It's the name of the game is inches, really. We're fighting for inches, centimeters here, there. That's what makes it so special. And that's what makes winning feel so damn great. And when I was competing in Tokyo, I was young. I was 16. I just turned 16. I was competing at my first Paralympics. And I was sort of scratching the podium. I felt I was close enough to get it. I felt I was close enough to potentially win. But a couple things would have to go my way. And it didn't. A couple guys jumped really well. It was pouring rain. I had actually never uh, high jumped in the rain before. Um, not that that was an excuse by any means, but rather just variables I hadn't fully prepared for. And so didn't go my way, really devastating, took a real toll on me mentally, but I was able to get through it and get through it stronger. And then moving forward, I knew I would get bigger. I knew I would get stronger. I knew I would get faster, more powerful, just as I continue to go through puberty. And then you combine that with more training, you combine that with more sacrifice, you combine that with more discipline, and you combine that with more time. And all of a sudden, you got yourself in a really good position. And so I felt I was in a great position leading up to world championships a couple months ago. And uh, I went out there and I won my first world title, which was very, very exciting and uh, a step in the right direction. I mean, listen, you have people who win their first world title and they get complacent. All this has done for me is said, that's great. We won our first world title. We did the, we accomplished a, a, a lifelong goal, but that's nothing until I win the Paralympics. And so that's my mindset now, which is winning a world title is great, but I got to do it again next year or that doesn't really matter. And rather it was a step in the right direction, not the destination. And uh, now that I'm coming into this year with something to defend, I've got a new level of, of confidence, a new level of excitement, and I'm just prepared to to show the world, really. It must be amazing for you to think that it's already been almost five years since you were the youngest athlete in the world to compete at the World Para Athletics Championships. And you you were in the high jump, you were in the long jump, and you were the 100 meter. Yep. Yeah. The while, 14. <laughs> that, was, that was in Dubai, 2019. I was Great. 14. Yeah, I was 14. I was the youngest athlete in, in the whole competition. Um, and then... Now here I am fighting for a Paralympic gold. Crazy, crazy timeline. We asked Gabby about what it's like being in the blocks before she runs. And I want to ask you about high jump just to get into the mind of the athlete. Yeah. What are you thinking as you're getting ready to to do a jump? How locked in are you? Do you block out the world? Do you block? Are you? What's going through your mind? Take us there. Yeah. So going back to that meditation that I do leading up, I meditate and I visualize on exactly what I expect to happen in the competition. I know where the stands are going to be. I have photos of what the stadium looks like Mm -hmm. all over my phone, taped up all around my room. 
I know where the camera is going to be. I know usually what color the mat, the bar, where the stands are going to be, where we're going to be sitting relative to the high jump mat. I do everything mentally to prepare myself before and run through exactly what I want to happen during the competition, exactly what I know is going to happen during the competition. And I kid you not, and you might not believe me, everything to a T that I visualized every single day for those six, seven, eight months leading up to world championships, it went exactly as I planned. Wow. I had, I knew exactly what progressions the bar was going to go up at, and they didn't even send it to me. I just, I knew, I, I visualized what progressions the bar was going to go up at. It went up at those exact progressions. I knew what height my competitors were going to fall out at. They fell out at exactly those heights. Everything that I visualized went exactly as I anticipated. So much so that when I was competing, I was feeling deja vu because I had literally lived that experience in my head hundreds and hundreds of times previously. So as I'm walking up to the bar and I'm prepared to take a jump, I'm really only focused on a couple things. A couple things that my coach cues me at world championships, it was making sure that I was pushing out well out the back and jumping straight up. I was only focused on those two things because in the lead up of all of my meditations, that's the only things that I was focusing on. I knew what I was going to be thinking about. I knew the type of breathing I was going to be doing. I was knowing what exact smells I would be smelling right before I was about to jump, what exactly I would be wearing, where my family would be, everything perfectly planned out in my head months and months and months before. So when I got there, it was like second nature. Wow. The mental fortitude. Really? I mean, it's, that's incredible. That's Thank incredible. You. Thank so you. you're, 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 are you visualizing everything in Paris right now? You've got it down to a T again. You're just replicating uh, that right now is right now is the stage where I'm sort of gathering, I'm you're gathering, formulating. I'm formulating where and how I want to approach this meditation and approach this visualization and then probably once i start up on the track again in about a month or so um or in a couple months i'll probably start that daily meditation and then run that through paris yeah this tells me that regardless no matter who you are and when what you're trying to achieve that power of the visualization and 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 setting your mind on the task that is already complete yeah. mentally can get you anywhere. It literally can. Doesn't matter what you're it's, doing. It's not just sports. It's not just sports. It's not just track. This is anything. Anything you want in life, if you put yourself in that position in your head where you're accomplishing that thing over and over and over and over and how exactly you're going to get there over and over and over, it will happen. Especially if you speak it aloud and you say it with confidence and you manifest that and you put it out into the universe, it will happen. People just shy to say that type of stuff because they're concerned they're not going to accomplish it and they're going to look bad. That's mm. the first step to failing. If you're admitting that you're afraid to say it out loud because you're concerned you're not going to accomplish it, you've already admitted to yourself that you're not going to do it. So you won't. It's saying it with that conviction and confidence that tricks the brain into believing that that is actually what you are going to do. Wow. Do you have any favorite athletes or authors who've taken the same approach? Um, a fa an athlete that I would say I draw a lot from, um, outside of say the smack talk is Conor McGregor, his visualization okay. that he mm -hmm. put out into the universe is something I've, I've been very, very fascinated with. And I've, I've, uh, read up a ton on the way he viewed everything. I mean, he came from, from nearly nothing. And with this same mentality of visualizing and speaking it aloud and manifesting it ended up accomplishing that. Um, and then, you know, as far as, as far as the work ethic goes, I take a lot from Kobe. I take a lot from Kobe. He was an obsessive. The obsessives are the ones that become truly great. And so Kobe wasn't obsessive. I take a lot from him, the way he studied the game, the lengths that he went to, to understand how he can improve. That's what I hope to do. I mean, Kobe used to, Kobe used to study where referees would be on the court at specific times. So he knew where he could draw fouls because the ref wouldn't be able to see exactly what was happening. That's the level, that's the level of obsession that he had. And that's the level of obsession that I hope to take into my sport and figure out ways I can squeeze all the potential out of every single day. So besides Kobe or Conor McGregor, to whom do you also look for inspiration? 
my parents are probably the biggest sources of inspiration in my life. Mm -hmm. They sacrifice a lot to allow me to be in this position and to help me get closer to my goals. And they are some of the most hardworking people I know. So if I ever am lacking inspiration, I look to them and the way they've raised me and my brothers, what they've done for my family, the way they've impacted this community. And that is uh, that is definitely a large source of inspiration for me, which is just the love that I receive from my parents and the way that my parents have approached life. Yeah, wonderful. What does the future look like for you, Ezra, beyond the gold at Paris? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I appreciate you saying it like that. Oftentimes people go, you know, uh, assuming you're hoping you win gold and you know, you know how to say it, you know, we're aligned like that. Yeah. Um, what's beyond that is I pro- I'm going to probably go to college after, after the Paralympics. I've taken a gap year now to spend the whole year training and preparing for Paris. So most likely I'll go to college after, after I compete at the games. And where so, do you want to go? Well, we're in talks right now. We'll see where I can get some offers from. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, looking at some of the UCs, maybe, maybe USC, maybe a good academic sports school, Stanford. Um, we're just, we're just sort of seeing where we get some interest from, and then we'll, we'll hopefully commit somewhere soon, not super picky, but more so trying to find a coach and a program that are willing to take me on. And, uh, but so yeah, going to university after that, get my education and uh, hopefully continue to build the brand, continue to grow the profile of the Paralympic movement and uh, normalize disability. And uh, who knows if that means some things in the entertainment industry, some more content that I'll be putting out, not sure exactly where the path will lead me, but definitely somewhere in that direction. But do you have a podcast yet? I don't have a podcast yet, but I'm, that's definitely on the horizon. Something yeah, I want to do. I can tell. I, uh, I know somebody who, who could co-host it with you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, how about the total number of Olympics at which you may compete? What are you thinking? How, how long does this go? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think for me, at least 100%, I'm going through LA. 100% going through okay. LA. I'll, I'll be 23 LA. That's really, that's the where I, I believe I see my peak is Los Angeles 2028. My goal or my plan rather is to win something that I've deemed the triple crown, which is gold in the high jump, gold in the long jump, gold in the 100 meter, all at the LA 28 Paralympics. Never been done before. In your hometown. The history in my hometown, never been done before in the history of the Olympics, Paralympics, track and field in general. Nobody's ever won those three events. And I plan to pull that off hometown, home city, LA 28 Paralympics. And so what happens after that, I'll probably end up going to Brisbane, going to 2032. I'll only be 27, so I'll still be pretty young. I could definitely go (laughs) to 2036, and uh, probably 2036 or 2040 is probably where I bow out. But you never know. Life could happen. There's injuries all the time, career-ending ones. I'm trying to avoid that as much as possible, knock on wood, and stay healthy. Um, So I don't know where where the path will take me, but 100% winning the Triple Crown in L.A., and then we'll see what happens after that. Wow. I just laid out the whole... See, you've already visualized this, Ezra. <laughs> what am I oh, saying? Oh, <laughs> Jason, Jason, I know exactly where I'm going to be at 25, 30, 35, all right here. That's yeah, the that's plan. Inspirational. That's inspirational. Thank you. Um, thank you. Just a few more things. Uh, yeah. Since the show is about cars and culture, what's in the garage? Um, and have you ever been to a high-performance driving school or been around anything like that? Are you a car guy? Listen, I, I've, I am a car guy. I've been, and I've been getting into cars more and more, obviously, since joining Toyota. And uh, funny enough, you asked ask what's in the garage because just a couple hours ago, I picked up my brand new 4Runner TRD Pro in solar octane and just <laughs> have it parked right outside. Right Congratulations. Now. Just picked it up. <laughs> just picked it up. I had a white loaner one for a couple months. Uh, since uh, actually a little bit longer than that, for about six months, I've had this white loner uh, TRD Pro Forerunner, and uh, but been dying to get that Solar Octane. Just picked it up, and it is breathtaking. Let me say, breathtaking. Do you post a photo yet on social? I haven't posted. You know what I'm doing actually is I'm I'm getting my family and friends' reaction to the car, and so I'm getting all their reactions. I'll put it together, stitch it together. I'll probably post a video shortly, um, showing the car, but it is epic so epic and listen a lot of people were saying 
are you sure you want a bright orange car? It's really stands out a lot. And I was like, listen, my whole life I've walked around with one leg. I've been standing out already. This is my personality. I might as well embrace it and get the dopest car ever, you know? <laughs> that is one heck of a ride to pick. I love it. That's so good. I well, appreciate we'll have to, it. We'll have to have you back on the program to do a car review after you've had it for a little hundred percent. A hundred percent. Definitely. Oh, that's great. And you obviously love you you I mean, you love flashy car. I mean, you love energy and car and cars that exactly. Have that's a, that's what it was. I was thinking about getting a Supra as well potentially but my parents said they didn't want me having a sports car just yet so i said ah that's all good trd pro forerunner is gorgeous i'm gonna get it in the brightest color i can find that's exactly what happened good for you thank you two final things if you have a message for someone who does not have a physical disability about how to behave around and treat those who do yeah what would that be yeah my advice to someone who doesn't know what to say, doesn't know how to approach disability, doesn't want to say the wrong thing, would be come at it with good intentions. You come at it with good intentions. More often than not, the person with the disability understands that and they recognize that. And so rather than being in public and staring and whispering and, oh, well, look at that person's leg, go up, have a conversation, be open, let's have a dialogue, ask questions, be curious, be respectful. All of that with good intentions is the best way to approach disability and not assuming that disability is some super negative thing. I've had people come up to me my whole life and apologize. Like, I'm so sorry you're disabled. I'm like, sorry, this this is, I'm happy. I like this. What do you yeah. mean? I get, Have I you got talked cool, to me? <laughs> I got a cool prosthetic leg. I get to do what I love. I compete around the world. My life is great. This is not a hindrance. This is not some super negative thing. And so don't always look at disability as, as a negative thing and rather approach it with a curiosity, with good intentions and, and have those, those conversations and dialogues. Yeah. I want to go back to uh, an incredible post that your mother made at one point. Um, after, after you had qualified for the Paralympics in Tokyo mm. 2020, you know the one. She wrote, I look at pics of you as a little munchkin and then now in trials for the Paralympics, and I'm bursting. I can't put into words how much joy, pride, love, excitement, and gratitude I have in my heart. Wow. Words from a mother. Just incredible. I can't wait to see what she writes after Paris. I just got chills. I got goosebumps when you read that. Yeah, that's quite special to look back on. I mean, oftentimes I'm not looking back on these older Instagram posts that my my mother has made, but that one is quite special. I mean, this is this is the journey. It's a family affair here. My f- parents, my brothers are just as invested in this as I am. And they care about it in the same way I do. And they believe in me maybe even more than I believe in myself sometimes. And so being able to share the joys of the highs and obviously the devastation of the lows with them is something I'll, I'll forever cherish. And I'm, I'm immensely grateful for. You told the world you were coming and you're here. Congratulations. We can't wait to see what happens in Paris. Uh, Gladly take your bag wherever you need it around France. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. We will be watching with enormous interest. Thank you for showing everyone the way to be human. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate you having me on. This was a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Thanks again to my guest today, American Paralympic athlete Ezra Frank. And to see my interview with him, go to the Cars and Culture YouTube channel. You can like and subscribe to see more than 120 interviews and nearly a 1,000 videos. More great guests are coming on Cars and Culture. Come back in the following weeks to hear from racer Graham Rahal, as well as Bruno Senna and Corvette designer Rich Shear. I'm Jason Stein. We'll see you down the road.